You're listening to the Curious About Cannabis podcast. The Curious About Cannabis podcast is brought to you by the generous support of fans just like you. Find out how you can support the show and get access to exclusive content, merchandise discounts, and more at patreon.com slash curious about cannabis. If you want to learn even more about cannabis, check out the Curious About Cannabis book at cacpodcast.com slash book, or check out our Curious About Cannabis online courses and educational events at the Natural Learning Academy at learn.naturalledu.com. Well, my name is Russell Pace, and I'm the president of the Cannabis Horticultural Association, otherwise known as CHA or CHA. And uh, I've been doing this for about five years now, just slowly creating this association to help promote the uh, proliferation of the organic and ecological management practices for cannabis, you know, kind of help improve the regenerative agricultural uh, communities concepts uh, in the cannabis space. So I'm really excited to engage with the cannabis community. I've been part of this for a long time. And, um, so, uh, you know, you can check us out at cha.education or on Instagram, the same handle. And uh, I look forward to continuing to create this amazing new developing industry and having it basically function as sort of the hub to promote all of these really important practices for Earth. We must work untiringly so that our children are obliged you're listening to the curious about cannabis podcast hey everybody this is jason wilson with the curious about cannabis podcast thanks so much for tuning in once again uh, so today we're going to be talking all about, uh, I guess the best way to phrase it would be like ecologically conscious cannabis cultivation. I'm here with Russell Pace from the Cannabis Horticultural Association. Uh, Russell, thanks so much for being willing to come on the podcast today. Yeah, thanks, Jason. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to talking to you today. Yeah, absolutely. And we can just uh, dive straight in because we've been talking a bit um, off camera here. I think we're really well primed. Uh, one of the some of the things I really wanted to jump in here, you know, we're recording this in um, early May, so a lot of people are uh, waiting for those, especially around here in like Southern Oregon, Northern California areas, waiting for those last freezes to come through to start to get plants in the ground. And I thought it'd be a really perfect time to discuss this idea of what does it mean in the context of cannabis cultivation to try to grow. Um, in this sort of ecological conscious mindset, regenerative cultivation, sustainable cultivation, you know, whatever term you want to kind of yeah. apply to it. Um, and so I guess the the first thing I wanted to dive into is in your mind, as you approach cultivating anything, but particularly cannabis, what does, you know, uh, ecologically responsible cannabis cultivation look like? Sure. To you? Yeah, you know, I, I think, there's definitely a lot of different names that people use for it. You know, it's like it covers this whole range of names, biodynamic, regenerative, organic, ecological, ex artisanal, et cetera. But I mean, ultimately to me, it, the, the whole concept revolves around closed loop systems. I mean, that, that's sort of what it is it, it, in a nutshell is, you know, where, if you have the capacity to generate your own compost, you're doing that. And if you have the capacity for animal hub husbandry, you're creating your own fertilizer or planting your own dynamic accumulators. Or if you can't do that, you're getting, you're looking for local farms and local sources. You're not trying to outsource it from the world. You know that, I mean, that's the pinnacle of the concept. So that's sort of it in a nutshell, you know, you're, you're trying to reduce water usage, you know, increase organic matter to reduce the amount of water you're using and to create, you know, a, a healthy environment for uh, beneficial insects, you know, because the, uh, the, I mean, I love the insectary industry. It's, it's been a, a real help to me for understanding all of this, but ultimately, you know, buying and shipping all of these things, you know, is a, 
a carbon a set, you know, sink and also just other, there's other, you know, gas and other ecological packaging issues that, so if you can create your own system, you're, you're trying to essentially integrate, you know, all of these different elements into your own backyard system or perhaps, you know, commercial space, ideally, uh, to create that, that more of that closed loop system where, where you have all those, those elements that you're, that you're creating uh, to, to create that. And then essentially that also improves plant health. You know, if you're doing it right, you're creating a system where you're not over applying fertilizer or you're not using pesticides. Or if you are using pesticides, they're more like the organic pesticides, you know, your garlic and pepper extracts or your, what, you know, if you do have to, you know, do create some element of that, that it's more, it's, it's definitely more environmentally friendly. Essentially, it's like a closed loop, environmentally friendly version of all of these. And it's a it's a really big concept because it uh, how you go about that is sort of different depending on your situation, your scale, uh, which is definitely something I, w- I want to get into. And for people that are considering going down this road that maybe have been cultivating cannabis, you know, kind of in the conventional input heavy, you know, sort of monoculture style, and, and they're wanting to switch gears. Um, what are some of the common challenges that I guess, new cultivators kind of run into when they're trying to uh, develop a more self sustaining cultivation system? Mm-hmm. Because uh, I know from experience, it's, it's not easy to just, um, you know, kind of jump into that. Uh, yeah. Things, things, nature doesn't always go as you as you plan yeah that's true that's true i would say just off the cuff you know probably one of the biggest challenges would be plant health that you know they're running into nutrient deficiency issues they're trying uh, to create yeah. a living soil and they're and they're adding these inputs that they are creating and then they're running into strange nutrient deficiencies because they don't they don't know what they're doing. Now they're trying to be the ones in control of the system or provide all of these plant health, uh, plant nutrients. Um, and so it's, uh, I think probably that might be one of the biggest, biggest issues. You know, you're getting weird burning on the leaves or discoloration or, you know, speckling. And, you know, maybe you're, you added too much organic matter and now the soil's too wet and oversaturated and it's not drying out fast enough or you're, not in the right environment, you know, it's like, it depends on geographically where you are. If you're in a really hot, arid place, like we are in Willow Creek, you know, adding extra compost isn't a big deal uh, in the summertime, but if you're in a place that stays cooler, you know, or you have cooler environments, Mm -hmm. that might be a problem because your soil is becoming oversaturated. It's not drying out fast enough. Um, There's all sorts of little intricacies, little caveats, but I, I would probably say, you know, nutrient deficiencies is a big one. And then obviously, you know, pests is another one. If you're trying to, you know, get away from pesticides, spraying pesticides and you're trying to integrate beneficial insects and you don't know what you're doing, you know, you think you just release some predator mites and or the problem, you know, maybe you did release them at a wrong time. You know, you don't know enough about the mites behaviors. Perhaps you bought the wrong mites, you know, and they are, they're more designed to be in a higher relative humidity at a lower temperature, but you're in a really hot, arid environment, you release them and they all die. And then you're wondering why it didn't work, you know, you don't, and you think they don't work, but the reality is you just didn't like do enough research to find the right species or, you know, if it didn't, you know, just all of those variables are pretty uh, in, in, interrelated. And so uh, that those kind of concepts are what some of the biggest hurdles are, you know, but mainly, you know, nutrient, yeah. Nutrient yeah. inputs are a big one. Well, and the the IPM thing I could see being really huge too, because um, from my experience, it seems like a lot of growers have already shifted towards compost teas and that sort of thing, but maybe they're still having trouble pulling back on pesticides or pulling back on, you know, trying to figure out how to balance their pest management plan. Because even if they're using organic pesticides, you know, a lot of times they're still trying to figure out how to get beyond that, how to balance the system enough where they're not having to um, do a whole lot uh, of of 
sort of additional sprays and things like that. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up because I think the the predatory insects. I mean, I've experimented with them a little bit um, and have had that exact experience, you know, of like releasing them and watching them be like, oh, this is awesome. And then you come back the next day and they've all disappeared. Um, and <laughs> you, <laughs> you realize like, ah, OK, there's there's more to this than uh, I guess I thought there was. Um, where how do you how do you recommend people learn about and let's just hone in on that for a second predatory insects and and ipm um where would you recommend growers um uh, sort of look to to learn about all of these different predatory insects and their life cycles and that sort of thing have you found some good resources that you trust i mean even like the cha um sure website i know you've got like all sorts of content on there yeah yeah i mean that's i've definitely over the years you know i have so much content to add but i have I, i've leaned quite heavily on ipm on developing the content in in the cha.education website the memberships people can sign up there's I've sort of compiled a ton of pieces of information about all the different predator, predatory insects. We don't have all of them, but there's quite a few uh, in there. And so there's people can learn about the insect, its role in pest management, you know, and its environmental conditions. So um, that's a good resource. But ultimately, uh, you know, this has just been a, an ongoing discovery process where you can go on the internet and you can look up a bunch of different collegiate level, you know, pages. A lot of different universities have information on beneficial insects. A lot of insectaries also have information on beneficial insects. And so it's like, you can just, you just need to traverse the internet if you want to and read, you could probably find it all out there all over the internet, but you know, for me, I just consolidated everything into one website, so it's easier to find. Which is, I mean, that's something that I I really appreciated. I've followed your content for quite a while now, and that's something I noticed that you um, would post about quite frequently. It was like trying to understand uh, what all of these different insects are are doing and and their appropriate applications and stuff, which I thought was um, really really fascinating because it's kind of a it's kind of a rabbit hole you can dive into. Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah. There's, it's super cool. Like I, I'm nerding out. I, it's funny because I'm like normally decently mellow, but it's like for some reason with beneficial insects, it's like a really, really super cool thing to me because here they are, these little helpers. They're like little, ro like these almost like robotic helpers that are there to help you. All you have to do is like facilitate their environment. And then they come and then they do all the work for you, you know, and you're just like helping them. You're helping design their habitat and then they're helping you and preventing you from having to spray pesticides, you know? So it's like, oh, this is a, this is a win. It's a symbiotic relationship for, for real. And uh, that's, yeah, it's cool stuff. It is. It's, it's super cool. And, and thinking about like the relationship between, um, like the insects and then think about like endophytes and things microorganisms that live you know within and on the plant and 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 some of that involvement um i i don't know i start to really geek out on some of that too just learning about the i don't know the the defenses that a plant has at its disposal in nature between all of these components it's just fascinating it's like all of these different uh oh. layers of armor or something you know yeah you've got Basically, yeah, these little almost like robots that are um, running around uh, trying to gobble gobble up larvae and stuff of potential, you know, uh, um, insects that could cause problems. You have microorganisms that are even um, colonizing other microorganisms to keep them in check. It's it's um, really humbling to like dive into that complexity and realize how plants take care of themselves um in the wild and then to compare that with kind of what where we've gotten to with modern agriculture where everything is so relatively sterilized yes 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 yeah it's fascinating it's 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 so you know that's been a lot of my goal is to understand how the insects work how to keep them around in the environment 
you know, and, and one of the biggest things was like finding, making sure they have a food source. Right. You know, mm -hmm. so yeah. like, I love, I started learning about the pirate bug a long time ago and found out, you know, it can eat pollen. So I'm like, Oh, well, what kind of pollen, you know, can I have, what kind of flowers have pollen that yeah. can survive on, you know? So I was like, found I found calendula. It loves calendula. Like it's always in my calendula flowers. So I have like thousand i probably have a thousand calendula flowers i mean i'm not exaggerating there's like so much calendula and then also uh interesting i learned uh relatively recently i mean within the last few years was uh you know pred certain predator mites can feed on pollen too and so uh you know matthew gates this entomologist and i we ran an experiment on uh the explosive amber pepper plants and their ability to house and maintain uh, a predator mite called the Swirsky eye. Uh, and so, uh, we, we, you know, we basically grew these peppers. The peppers put off these little purple flowers. We inoculated the mites on the peppers. And I observed them. I, I basically studied them over the course of the summer before the first heavy frost in the fall. And I was able to document that the mites were on the, the plants the entire time. You know, so that the pep these plants did allow for the mites to survive and reproduce on these these pepper plants. Um, and so, you know, that was kind of a cool little experiment. But you know, obviously, it's like the caveat is like you have to grow the pepper, you have to care mm -hmm. feed, you know, fertilize the pepper, you have to water the pepper, right? You know, the peppers also have other pests that are on it. So there's some aphids are on it or thrips, you know. Sure. So you know, it's like this it's this like really complex relationship that you have to begin managing within that environment, you know? Um, and so, but you know, there's other options too for people that want to do predator mites, I guess there's certain insectaries that sell pollen. Mm -hmm. Like they actually sell little packets of pollen, like uh, peach, peach pollen or something like that. Uh, there's certain fruit tree pollen or other, I know in one experiment they did cattail pollen, mm. you know, but basically essentially the mites are eating these, they, they can eat these pollen grains in times of low, low pest pressure where there's no food for them. Keep them around. So that would be a way to, yeah, you keep them around. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm sure there's a lot of caveats, you know, with that, like, where do you put the pollen on the plant? Mm. Like, how do you, you know, is there a moisture humidity i don't know there's all sorts of uh things ah, that yeah. i'm still learning about with with there's still all sorts of things that i'm learning about with that but i think that's really cool that's like that's a really cool concept like you know and then the idea also is like well can you can you create can you rear them can you buy mm -hmm. a pack of mites and then like just put them in a box with a bunch of pollen are they gonna like reproduce can you can you make your own i don't know but that sounds pretty cool you know to think that you could just like be continuously producing your own source of these mites you could farm them yeah you'd farm them i mean yeah, yeah yeah i mean i'm sure that that's like an oversimplified concept and there's like all sorts of environmental controls that you'd need for them to sure survive yeah. but i mean i don't know you know it's it sounds interesting it, it's be cool it does yeah and it, it's it really fits that kind of like uh I don't know, this sort of permaculture mm. idea of, um, you know, having uh, farming all of these different things that have interconnected functions um, yeah. to, to serve the, yeah, the farm as a whole. Part of the closed loop system. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And this, this segues perfectly into uh, another thing I wanted to talk about, which is companion plants. You know, so you were just talking you know, uh, uh, about sort of one, one side of companion planting that you could plants, certain plants to house um, either uh, predatory insects or you could divert potentially uh, pests that might would want to attack cannabis, maybe find plants that are, you know, kind of more interesting, you know, that, that they could sort of gravitate towards. So what are some uh, good companion plants that you found that go well in, in cannabis gardens? Mm, yeah, good question. Well, I think um, it, it sort of depends on um, what, you know, what your goal is. Like, are you trying to create a trap crop? You know, like if you have spider mites mm -hmm. or something, do you want to try to, you want to try to create the trap crop for, to keep the mites more on, you know, this other plant, you know, 
well, uh, a, a beans are a good way to do that. Spider mites love beans. And uh, I learned that from a few years back from farmer Tom. What's his, I always I apologize, Tom, but your last name's like Laura, Lorman. He was like the, he's up in Washington state. He was like the first farmer, cannabis farmer that the DEA actually visited to like look at his farm once this like was all going legal or something like that. I'm skewing that a bit, but he has an interesting background with that. Um, anyways, but he does, he was, you know, explaining how beans are a good source of uh, yeah. trap cropping for spider mites and um, I, I've seen that uh, in, in practice, uh, you know, so you have to look at just like the function, like what other, what other species of trap crops, uh, you know, to pull pests away. You can look, we can go into that, but specifically for attracting beneficial insects, you know, it's, you can look at a bunch of different components there. Like if you're looking at, I think, and I honestly think that we're just scratching the surface. Like I think there's a ton of research that needs to be done with that. And so, oh, yeah. you know, it's like for me, I, in my environment, I've found like, if you just look at my environment, let's just look at my environment. So over the last few years, I have a ton of calendula. I have a ton of borage. I have a lot of white yarrow. Uh, I've got, you know, mm. a bunch of uh, comfrey. Um, I know there's a lot of other ones. Oh yeah, there's a lot of mullein. I have a lot of mullen. Mullen, uh, mullen's used. I, I re recently learned uh, there's a mm. generalist predator called Dicephus. Dicephus. It's like a it's a weird word, Dicephus, but it's a predator. And and I found them quite heavily on the mullen, which is cool. Um, maybe I should. Yeah, I could go through. I've seen the I've seen the pirate bugs a lot on the calendula and the borage, mm. um, and then the Dicephus is on the mullen. The comfrey, I don't, I haven't seen many predators on, but the bees love it. Um, and um, the yarrow, I've seen ladybugs on the yarrow. Amazingly, last year it was just like out, it was a total mm -hmm. fluke. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know if you caught wind of that, but I did this intercropping research project with carrots and auto flowers, and we had this like border long row. We had this long row of auto flowers and then intercropped right below that were the carrots. Oh, yeah, I remember that. You know, that. densely planted carrots. And it was more of a research experiment to see if you can grow two crops, you know, that in close proximity to each other and still achieve, you know, good harvests. And then it just turned, it turned in, it actually completely turned into this amazing research project where there was so many ladybugs. Yeah. Like all of a sudden on all the little carrot leafy green parts it was just like loaded with ladybugs breeding and they're just i was like holy cow there's so many ladybugs breathing breeding and then you know on the on the on the auto flowers because we have the hemp aphid you know it's a bit of a problem it's not too bad but there were hemp a aphids oh. on those the cannabis aphids and um then what happened the ladybugs were breeding on the the, the carrots and then all of a sudden you see all these eggs sachet uh, little egg clusters all over the auto flowers and then the ladybug or the lady beetles are hatching the larvae are eating all of the uh aphids and it was just it's like <laughs> it was it was really amazing it was like an, it was the, probably the coolest thing i've ever seen to, at, at scale to see like that system truly functioning like not not like where it it worked a little bit and then you had to spray pesticides because it didn't work all the way it fully worked like it absolutely worked you know and so i think one of the caveats like i, I would say like one of the major caveats with yeah. you know all of these concepts with companion planting is like you know people want to just plant like one wow. plant one flower you know and then just, that's enough and then they think that's enough but it's i, I don't think that's true i think the caveat is that you have to have like 25% of your square footage dedicated mm -hmm. to companion planting. You know, so if you have 10 square feet, you need 2.5 square feet of space for companion planting at least to, to create the, the right ratio of beneficial insects. Mm -hmm. And that's a really, that's, that's still a rough number, you know, but I would say that's like a at, at minimum 25%. And that's the caveat. That's really the rub, as I like to say, because 
Yeah. That's where you run into you need to add fertilizer and you need to add water and is it a is it a fair trade off? Like is it easier to just yeah. you know only grow cannabis and spray organic pesticides, you know? It's that's a tough question. That's and I mean on a backyard scale I think it's probably easier, but then when you get into commercial space, you know, you're talking about watering using a lot more water. And some people have water restrictions and it's, you know, harder to manage. So it's, it's not an easy question to, you know, answer. So, yeah. Um, but kind of t tan tangenting back to companion plants. Um, I mean, it, I'm just, I've just been researching them so much. It's, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to really quantify, uh, what the other ones are it's like i've recently planted valerian and i've noticed a lot of predator insects on valerian flowers too and i mean if i go around i start thinking i have like so many different species we have a ton of oregano and we have a ton of mint and we have a ton of yar uh, feverfew and whorehound and lemon balm and mm -hmm. fennel and uh you know, just, I'm trying to think because there's so many different species everywhere. Um, you know, there's all sorts mm -hmm. of flowers um, from uh, carrot flowers, just carrot flowers themselves. They're, th those big white flowers, those those attract all sorts of types of parasitic wasps and, and ladybugs too. And that whole family, I'm trying, Matthew would know, he would get mad at me because I can't remember, but it's the it's the family it's a family of flowers that are like the fennel yeah. and the dill and the carrots yeah. those big round flowers like asteracea or something that those attract a lot of parasitic wasps um so um you know all of the there's all these interrelated uh companion plants <laughs> that overlap and attract multiple species of beneficials and do different things uh uh buckwheat mm. buckwheat's another good one we have a lot of buckwheat growing. That's a good trap crop for aphids. Uh, and then the flowers attract beneficials. Um, well, and this uh, is sort of where I wanted to go next was, you know, you're pointing out that um, trying to, to cultivate this way, it requires not only a different way of thinking, but a different way of resource planning that, you know, as you're introducing all of these different elements, you've then got to think about, how do you, you know, tend to not just one crop, but all these different crops and ensure that everything's working the same way. And in a small garden, that is much easier to do. You know, like here at my house, you know, I integrate a lot of these different things into my garden and, and my garden's pretty wild in general. I do very little <laughs> other than some very minor, um, you know, manicuring here and there to, to knock some some plants back that are overgrowing others but other than that it kind of just does its thing and that works for me in a small garden here but i know that you work with uh you know you do consulting with you know fairly large growers and you know and that sort of thing how do you how do you have to change your thinking to apply these concepts at scale yeah yeah well it let me tell you what it's not an easy it's not easy and i i think I think I think the the number one the number one thing that I have is patience patience for change. A lot of times people want to come in and they just want to revamp the whole system right right away, you know, just redo it all. And a lot of that times that makes growers and farmers very nervous, you know, tradition the way they've been traditionally doing it doing it a certain way, you know, and there's a lot of bottom lines to be met. So I think when you get to that scale, you need to just slowly, just little incremental steps towards that system. You know, it's like if they're doing a certain fertilizer regimen, you, you don't change that, but you try to, I, I try to come in at first and I, and not change too much of what they're doing but just start trying to get them to plant beneficial plants in their environment to allow nature to establish, you know, its own, its own capacity to integrate all of these insectary plants into their environment. So literally I just ask them and get the go ahead. And then I'll just start, I'll get a bunch of different seeds from all bunch of different species 
and just in the winter scatter them around everywhere. Just literally seed the whole outer outer border, borders of their environment with these beneficial plants, the insectary plants, and see what takes. It's sort of like you're doing an experiment. You're like, let's see, let's see what takes and let's see how it fares in the summer and let's see how it can seed and self-replicate and then establish in that environment, you know? And that's a good first step because then you're just you're just integrating that that into the environment. It they don't nest you're seeing what can withstand summer heat. You're you're seeing, you know, what what's going to have, you know, pest issues. Uh you know, if there's any issues with that. Um, and so that's a good first step. And then, you know, you, with, with the other integrations, you know, you try to shift gears and you maybe suggest different types of pesticides, maybe, you know, the minimum risk 25 B pesticides are good, good look, you know, shift gears on their nutrient, um, you know, inputs, maybe, you know, reducing nutrient inputs, increasing foliar inputs, sort of starting to shift with some of the management practices so they're not over fertilizing, uh, which can lead to a lot of problems with pests. And so, you know, it's like just slow incremental shifts that take years, you know, it's like, I look at this as like a three year plan three to five years to get where they need to be. It's not just like one year. And, and to me, that seems like it's the best, it's the best course to take, you know, I, I've become more of a pragmatist. I used to be an idealist. And I think just the more I've grown and become privy to the inner workings of this massive beast we call capitalism, I've become more of a you know, pragmatist with understanding that the slow incremental shifts, unfortunately, just kind of work better. And just to be patient with it in, as, but, as best you can, it's like I can only do so much. So that's sort of how I've, how I've approached this whole thing. Yeah, and how, from your experience, how have those um, implementations gone? Uh, do cultivators, um, I guess the best way to ask, are they committed? Do they do they seem to be committed to that uh, long term plan, or do you find that after year one, year two, they start to revert back to you know, some of their old ways of doing things that they, you know, are more comfortable with and that sort of thing? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think ultimately the, there has to have proven results. Like they have to see the results. If the results aren't there, then they're going to revert back for sure. So the results have to be there for them to to actually want to to shift, you know, so could be something as simple as it could be something as simple as like okay well if you're not comfortable not using salt fertilizers well let's add some biology into it let's try to like shift and add biology to improve nutrient uptake so you can reduce that you know and like okay well let's try now that you're comfortable with that well let's try to show you what this plot does you know maybe take a quarter uh, eighth of their area and use a different fertilizer regimen and then like, oh, you know, let's look at the results with that. Well, now we now we have the amount of uh, these salt fertilizers increased all these biological and organic inputs. Oh, wow. Look mm -hmm. at like the look at the terpene levels. Look at how those have increased. OK, is that worth it to you? Is like, you know, maybe it's there's so many different variables that go into, you know, creating that. But I think ultimately yeah. just you, there has to be results that there. So. It's like as we're talking, I'm getting texts from people right now. Yeah, it's funny. It, do you find that there's a economic pitch, like when you when you're talking to a client about this project of trying to change the way they cultivate and get to a you know a more ecologically friendly uh, system? Do you have estimates on numbers of like what are how do the economics change in the in the cultivation environment? Um, ultimately, when you get past this, you know, three, four, five year, um, you know, sort of phase of transitioning, um, are companies finding they're you know spending a lot less you know financial resources on getting their crops to 
uh, harvest, you know, um, what does that just economic side of things look like uh, during this kind of transition? Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, it's, we're sort of in the real time data mode. Like this is, this is all happening in real time and all of the results are not in yet. Like we're still in discovery. We are in discovery. We are literally in the discovery process of trying to figure this out. And so it, I think ultimately I believe that the economics are, are there towards these closed loop systems. You know, it's like you have a huge farm, they've got a huge forest around them. There's insane amounts of compost material. It's like you can go harvest a lot of this material and take your cannabis stocks and you can create your own compost pile. Right. And then there's like the, the trade-off is like, so you have to pay someone to do that. You have to then, you know, manage the compost pile. Um, and you know, is that, is that worth, you know, or you just, you know, gather the duff and then spread it in the fall on all of the beds, you know, and then let it break down naturally over time. Like, is that, is that better than, than, you know, purchasing, you know, X number of thousands of dollars worth of compost, right? That's a complex, it's a really complex issue because there's so many different variables that can shift how the economics of that work. But I mean, ultimately it's like, if you, it's just, it's, it's gonna, it's, it's sort of a function of this model of capitalism to a degree. And I would argue that it would be prudent for any any company or system to begin examining ways to create that closed loop system because as as covid has shown the the international economics is a is in a constant state of flux and the product the supply chains are disrupted and if there's ways that you can find to get local you know products that that's better obviously it's like this is not an easy thing to do it's not. It's it's truly not. So you know, again, it's like it comes down to scale. If you're just your backyard farm or you know your five thousand square foot gardener, you're gonna be. It's gonna be much easier to get. You know, go to your local alpaca farm and get the alpaca manure, and then maybe get you know the pile of wood chips, on you know that the forest service left. You know. It, it, but once you get up to 10,000, 20,000, 40,000 square feet, you know, the dynamics of that becomes much harder to manage. Like, and there's not a, there's not an easy answer there. It, it, it's, and so it's like in this discovery process, trying to figure out how, how the fuck we can do that. Pardon my French, but just, that's the complexities of it. No, absolutely. And, and that leads into, you know, what I wanted to get your thoughts on is as the cannabis industry is, you know, really starting to flourish and we're seeing bigger and bigger farms, you know, getting established, especially on the hemp side of things, you know, just seeing massive farms uh, that don't have some of the restrictions, you know, um, what, what do you kind of hope to see from all of this? And I guess maybe that also spins out into the question of why are you so passionate about this in the first place? Um, But, but what, what do you, you know, sort of pragmatically, what do you hope to see from the cannabis industry as it really, you know, takes off? Um, And, you know, right now, it seems like a lot of cannabis cultivation is starting to just fall into the typical models of agriculture that, you know, we already have problems with, you know, that we're already trying to to wrestle with, um, and how to secure how to have food security, um, locally nationally internationally and everything you know without relying on monoculture crops that are uh you know can be taken out by you know a single pathogen and then you you lose (laughs) you know uh the ability to to feed entire nations of people so uh, yeah i guess to switch on into your idealistic mode for a bit and Mm. lessen the pragmatic what would you like to see from the future of cannabis cultivation yeah, and then to spin off from there, why why do you care so much about all of this in the first place? Well, I'll, I'll try to I won't go on try not to go on too much of a rant, but um, you know, the the whole concept of cannabis, it, cannabis to me is this quintessential model of understanding of like a 
awareness. It, it's, it's sort of like a plant that has been put here to help us increase our awareness. Mm. You could argue many different facets of that, whether it expands your consciousness, awareness of understanding when you invite, ingest it. But in also in a weird way, the testing of the cannabis plant, the stringent, stringent testing standards have also created awareness over pesticides and heavy metals in, in foods in a way people have now that understand all of the strict testing standards are now, well, now beginning to come in to yep. awareness to wake up and be like, well, what's on this tomato or apple or what is actually being sprayed on our foods? There's a level of awareness that it's creating that I find very important. And I think also with the regenerative community, I think that the whole concept of regenerative cannabis is creating a level of ecological awareness in the average human. So I, I think that that's an important step that cannabis is taking to, to move us, try to shift us into that model. You know, we have a long way to go still till we hit sort of the mainstream, but I think it's, we're moving in the right direction. And so I just think it's scale, it's scales. Again, it's tough when you're talking about, you know, hundreds of acres of hemp, you know, being planted and then you're dealing with all those plastic rows, you know, they, they're all, there's so much plastic used in the industry that drives me nuts. I, 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 my, I, it's like my life yeah. goal is to get away from plastic. I, I'm not joking. Like my life's goal is to only deal with cloth, steel or metal glass, stone or wood. Like I want everything to be made out of those elements. Like I don't want to see a fucking piece of plastic, <laughs> but it's, I understand it's like integral in some degree, like it's ubiquitous. And I just wish, <clears throat> I wish there was a way, I mean, look, here's my plat, you know, yeah. plastic air purifier. You know what I mean? You can't get away. It's, it's impossible to get away from it to some degree. Look, there's plastic cover for my wife's sewing machine. You know, it's like, you can't get away from it. It's, it's crazy, you know? Uh, but um, I guess where I'm going with that right. is, um, you know, like with large scale agriculture, they use a lot of the plastic row coverings, you know, and I mean, I'd like to see that bioplast. I'd love to see that made out mm -hmm. of bioplastic, you know, like I, I think ultimately it's like what this what this needs to be is like the regenerative model needs to hit some degree of awareness of people yeah. that are dedicated to help to helping lobby to, to allow government mm -hmm. subsidies for these ecologically friendly alternatives, you know, to, to, I mean, I think that's ultimately where it is. It's like, you need, you know, it's like I, I was getting involved with hemp fibers and I, you know, I was making these little hemp fiber grow pots, you know, that are biodegradable mm -hmm. completely out of hemp yeah. fiber and these long rolls and sheets of mulching. And it's like amazing mulching you can use, but it's just, it's crazy prohibitively. Yeah. But it's like, you know, 200 bucks for like a 300 foot roll. Like it's like really, it's just expensive, you know? Yeah. And that's the problem. And that's ultimately like the problem is that there's no subsidies oh, for creating cool. the manufacturing to that's reduce really cool. the cost of these things. And that's ultimately where we need to go. The, the awareness needs to hit a critical yeah. threshold yeah. with the people that are lobbying Congress to create new pro programs to create subsidies to improve this type of ecological agriculture that, you know, that's yeah. what needs to happen. I think, I mean, that's ultimately what needs to happen. And there's just a gap. There's a gap between those two spheres and, and to some degree, and I'm sure there's a lot going on that in that, that I'm not aware of right now, but I mean, that's, that's where, I mean, I'm getting, now that I think about it, maybe that's what we should just be doing. Maybe Cha should just be that. And maybe that's what we need to do. You know, like be that that sphere of influence that lobbies for these like government subsidies yeah. to create these more ecologically friendly programs. So you can buy a 5,000 yard roll of hemp bioplastic that you can put in your field and it's cheaper than this plastic crap that, you know, doesn't when, you know, breaks down. That's where we need to be. That's what I want to see in the world. Just like bioplastics, actually biodegradable. Not the not the stupid like 
thermally thermally compostable bullshit that everyone says you know you throw out the cup you throw in your compost pile and it's there for five years and you're like hold on a minute like this is oh it's thermally comp it needs to be heated up to like a 200 degrees okay i see your angle there yeah um, <laughs> right yeah yeah anything can be thermally composted with, <laughs> with yeah, right. enough uh I know enough energy, but yeah, that's sort of, I mean, that's ultimately what it is. <laughs> yeah. And, and what you're describing is like this way of trying to balance the scales because uh, a lot of these alternative ways of doing things, they're cheap in the short term in that, you know, to the person that needs to get the short term result, you know, it is much cheaper to just buy plastic, buy inputs, you know, these different things. Um, but there are all these hidden costs that are not represented in, um, you know, the price tag for those things. And so trying to find ways to take the more ecologically responsible ways of going about things that are economically more expensive and finding ways to incentivize the applications of those things to bring the cost down, to supplement the cost, tax credits, whatever that looks like, um, to try to acknowledge that there are these other costs that go into the cheaper alternatives. Um, and and yes. that's, yes. that's a hard, hard thing to manage, but that's, that is really what we need is like giving people the, the options and to recognize that there are, yeah, there are just all of these extraneous costs, these cascading effects related to those choices that, that have to be somehow, integrated in into it financially like there has to be something there um that's, yes that's going to either reward people for doing that or get the cost down or increase the costs of the alternatives yes i agree i think that's that's a great and so that 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 really triggers a lot of really interesting thoughts in my brain and i'll try to relay some of them now some of them would be like Tax, you say tax credits, you know, so like you have all these like regenerative farms in Humboldt County and Mendocino County, all over California, the Pacific Northwest. And, you know, they're paying the same types of taxes, fees mm -hmm. to the govern the state governments, these like crazy high taxes, you know, for all of their different, uh, you know, uh, structures of their, you know, business. So a, a really interesting system would be to the more the more you can close your loop, you know, the less inputs you have to use or purchase the lower your your taxes will be you actually get like tax breaks if you can prove that you have clo more of a closed loop system yeah i think that would be amazing because you're showing that you're not you know it's the system you're building is not you're not paying for the truck to to pay for the gas to ship this product here or, you know packaging waste or environment environmental impacts all of these these things actually yep. do matter and i think it would be an amazing amazing system to do, you know, I, I mean, people still kind of have that a little bit where like the artisanal boutique craftsmanship, you know, usually fetches a slightly higher price point, but it's not comparable. It doesn't actually mm -hmm. allow for the more people to integrate that because it, it's the, the people that are doing it are doing it because they love it and they believe in it, you know, and, but it would be really amazing to create more incentives and programs to create that, you know, really, truly. Or like you said, yeah. on the con converse side, to tax people higher who are doing these other, yeah. you know, they're already – that's probably – that's probably not the best look. They would probably get mad at me for saying that. But it could be, you know, just that you create tax breaks for those wishing to, you know, create these closed-loop systems. That might be a better alternative. Right. Well, and – It'd be an interesting um, incentivization system because, you know, it basically turned into this game where the more, you know, it's sort of like you can pay your taxes as, you know, money, you know, or you can essentially pay taxes by doing your part to steward the land, take care of natural resources. And if you do those things, then you can dramatically reduce your sort of economic tax burden, uh, recognizing that you are still taking care of your community, your local environments and everything by um, implementing all of those things. And so basically the more self-sustaining your systems can get, you know, you're reducing your tax burden and it's, it's not even just a like, oh, you did a good thing for the environment, but also you did a good thing for your community, for fellow taxpayers, like ultimately 
what you're doing is going to benefit, you know, downstream uh, in all of these sort of hard to quantify ways, but very real ways. I think that's a really interesting idea. Um, having like natural resource conservation be a type of way of paying your taxes in a sense. Uh, fascinating concept. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I, yeah, I think so too. I think there's a lot of potential there that's unexplored. I think there's a lot that can be expounded upon with that model. Absolutely. That's yeah. a great, that's a great look. And I just, I think this whole carp, like, just not to tangent too much, but it's like the whole carbon tax thing. I think it's <laughs> yeah. just a ploy. Like I, I, I just, I, it is something that doesn't sit right with the carbon tax. Mm -hmm. I think it's just a ploy for this international cabal to tax us and just to create like more taxes on this one concept with carbon as being the fundamental base. But then there's all sorts of other things like environmental pollution and waste and chemicals yep. and all these other complex things that are integrated that they're just like be like oh don't look over here just just carbon carbon you know right 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 just focus on the co2 just look at the co2 don't look at yeah. anything else yeah yeah i i totally agree i mean carbon tax credits in general it's become such a racket like they're you know how all of that i i can't remember what it was on but i watched some good documentary about carbon tax credits a long time ago um, that talked about how silly it all is. Like, you know, just these credits just get moved around, but, you know, you don't really see a lot of actual um, benefit. And you're right, like, focusing on carbon, you know, it's like focusing on this narrow symptom of such a huge, complex, interconnected problem that relates to the way that humans organize ourselves on the planet. And so it's like, yeah, it's it misses the uh, the big picture. I, I remember in uh, when I was studying um, environmental philosophy, you know, there's this concept of deep ecology, you know, trying to understand the uh, trying to get past the sort of band aid fixes like reducing CO2 emissions or, you know, whatever the uh, the focus is on the, at the time and yeah. trying to look at the the actual systemic issues. You know, like yes. what, how are humans organizing themselves on the planet that are causing these things and recognizing like the socioeconomic impacts, um, social equity stuff, like all of these pieces that fit together. Um, yeah. To, but yeah, I, I totally agree. I think focusing on carbon tax credits, it's an easy way to ignore the real problem and just focus on a game that just keeps people pushing money around, but doesn't really re you know, result yep. in much else. Yeah, I think so. You know, a bit just not to tangent too much, but it's exciting stuff. I think environmental health is a big one. Like, I don't, I don't think people quite understand how big uh, their their health is. Like that, yeah, pollution from chemicals, radiation, pesticides, etc. At all, these are impacting our health as humans to the tune of billions or trillions of dollars in health. And it's these, con I was going to write a book. I actually had a plan to write a book called Byproduct Nation. Yeah. And it was either I do cha or I write the book. And I chose the CHA. I chose to go that path. But in the back of my mind, it's been swirling around. And I have this whole like layout of this book. It would be amazing. Like I just, I can, I have it all spelled out. It's like the, everything, the whole industrial complex, all of the industrial complexes are creating byproducts from their, their main commodities and all of these thousands and thousands of byproducts, largely the petrochemical industry, but also the steel mm -hmm. industry and many other, they're, 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 all these byproducts are like repackaged and put back into yeah, yeah. these commercial products. And the collateral damage is our health. We absorb these things and the collateral damage is our health. And I think it's a huge, un, really unrealized, massive issue that needs to be looked at. So I'm kind of tangenting there, but uh, yeah, I think it's pretty important. And I, I just, I, I just think cannabis is here. Like and cannabis is here to help that. Like cannabis, the, the endo, the inside cannabis is this just incredible vast array of cannabinoids that are modulators for our endocannabinoid system. The, the, the medicine in cannabis can replace probably a vast amount of pharmaceutical drugs. Once it's once it's actually 
sort of like parsed into its all of its little components of what all these and these cannabinoids do and how they affect our different our limbic system, our musculoskeletal yeah. system, our nervous system, our digestive system. You know, once they're parsed out, they're going to be able to replace a lot of the pharmaceutical yeah. drugs. You know, and it's like the plan has evolved with us, obviously. So it's like if you could grow a, a, a bush of Advil, you know, you, you probably would, but you can't, but you can grow this plant and to a large degree, you can extract it, you can concentrate it and largely get a, this synergistic blend of these cannabinoids to help improve your health. And I mean, I think we rely on the, the money in the pharmaceutical industrial complex to help improve our knowledge of that. Like they're going to help improve like, oh, CBD is good for X, Y, Z, or CBG is also good for these things. You know, that's going to, that, that's the, that's the trade-off is that they're, unfortunately their money will help improve our knowledge of that, you know, and, and they're going to try to patent it and then take control of it. But ultimately it's the plant that we have for us. And that's the plant right. that's bringing awareness to all of this and all of these practices. So, you know, I think, um, I think it's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a really great way to kind of bring this back around. Um, we're going to have to have multiple conversations because there's like five conversations to unpack in just the uh, bit that we've gone into in the in this hour. Because, <laughs> um, you know, we're like really skimming the surface on a lot of things here. And I, I can tell like both of us could probably easily talk for hours on on a lot of this stuff. But this is a great way to to kind of uh wrap a, a nice bow on on the conversation we've we've had here um and so to to everyone listening i hope that you know uh some of these these concepts that we've talked about i hope that um you know if you're a cultivator you're taking them them seriously um especially where we're at now in the cannabis industry the way things are you know really taking off i think we're at a point where we're in a really special time where you know we have this unique opportunity to set um the sort of cultural standards habits and everything that this industry is going to adopt and and perpetuate and so you know hopefully we see you know greater and greater commitment to these sorts of ideals to integrate more you know ecologically conscious design over cultivation systems um i hope to see regulators understand the and environmental impacts of uh packaging you know some of these rules on on packaging are causing some substantial environmental issues um and so uh yeah i hope to see more of that and i'm right there along with you i think you know um this is the way we really have to move forward if we um are thinking long term about our civilization just being able to proceed forward to have decent food security, land security, all these different things, just basic resources for humans to continue to persist for, uh, you know, into the future. Like we've got to be uh, thinking about all these things and coming up with um, solutions. And I appreciate that you, you know, pointed out that this is really a real time effort that we're really, uh, you know, applying ecologically conscious design to cultivation. Like it's a technology. And it is a technology that yourself and many others, you know, around the world that recognize the value of these things are trying to develop and better understand so that people can implement them more efficiently um, in the future. So um, I view it very much as like a technology development kind of um, exercise and one of the most important ones um, that we need to be funneling resources into because uh, we've got to figure this stuff out. So. With all that rambling behind me, um, Russell, thanks so much for coming on the podcast to talk about all of this. I hope we uh, have opportunities to get together again and continue the conversation. And um, thanks so much for everything that you do and your commitment to try to educate people about um, all of these things and to try to you know, develop that technology and drive this uh, industry forward, hopefully towards um, better examples that we can start to see perpetuated out and uh, all sorts of agricultural industries uh, way beyond cannabis. So thanks so much for everything you do. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate it. And yeah, look forward to talking to you again in the future and continue this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, before we sign off, remind everyone again uh, where to find you on both uh, social media and your uh, CHA website. 
Sure. Yeah, the website is www.cha.education. And that's the same handle on Instagram too. And we have a Facebook page. I don't really do Facebook very much. I've basically been trapped in a little Instagram paradigm. So uh, that's where all the good stuff comes out. Yep. And um, we do, there's some, I've been trying to increase some uh, content on Vimeo, um, but still Instagram has been largely a source, Instagram and the mm-hmm. website for now. So those, that's where you can find us and uh, yeah. look forward to seeing you guys over there. Awesome. All right, everybody. Well, thanks so much for tuning in. If you want to learn more about Curious About Cannabis, just search for us on social media or find us on the web, cacpodcast.com. Oh, I also nab, finally, curiousaboutcannabis.net. Still trying to nab curiousaboutcannabis.com. Someone nabbed it from me long ago. Um, but curiousaboutcannabis.net, you can now find us there. Um, as well, we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. But you know, like Russell said, mostly Instagram. That's where the vast majority of the cannabis community hangs out anyway. So that's where we're most active. Um, Yeah. Thanks so much for tuning in. Everyone out there, stay curious and take it easy. And I'll connect with you again soon. Bye-bye. If you want to learn more about cannabis, check out the Curious About Cannabis book on Amazon.com and other major online book retailers. Thank you.